Welcome, and thank you so much for tuning in to our virtual book launch panel for the release of Into Abolitionist Theater, a guidebook for liberatory theater making. My name is Rivka Eckert, and I served as the editor and contributor of this collection. Today, myself and 14 of the book's contributors are gathered to share on our work within this context. Before I hand it over to other contributors, I'll start by providing a brief context uh, and framework and an invocation that is inspired by artistic rearranging, one of the theater making strategies that I mentioned in my chapter in the book. So some context, we launched this book in 2024 in a world that's ripened and cracking open. Currently, college campuses in the US are filled with the vibrancy of pro-Palestinian encampments and the brutal state-sanctioned violence of police response. The need for conversations around abolitionist work and theater's role within it is urgent and has been cultivated in slow process. Our work straddles the tensions of urgency and rest, scholarship and practice, artistry and pragmatism. So what is abolitionist theater making? Abolitionist theater is an emergent term that's used by the contributors of the book and aims to provoke critical thinking, propel practices of relationality and inspire action. By creating future visions and offering narratives counter to those based on racist capitalist ontologies, abolitionist theater makes visible the experiences of those affected by systemic oppression, encourages audiences to reflect on their own roles and responsibilities within these structures, and creates the conditions for change. Abolitionist theater making is complicated work, but we can hold the contradictions and tensions in service of building a flourishing, thriving, and prosperous practice together. The practices described in this book model how abolitionist theater rejects and unsettles the lo logics of carceral systems and creates conditions for liberation broadly defined. So who are we leaning on? Um, we lean on Black feminist scholars, justice organizers, academics, theater makers, and a broad range of disruptors. My interest in building an abolitionist theater making practice is at the intersections of community-based theater and theater in higher education. And it began with my investment in how theater can work to end mass incarceration while celebrating liberation, joy, and collective healing driven by the desire to create what John O'Neill calls little moments of clarity through performance, peeking at a world without prisons and the prison industrial complex. Abolitionist theater fits within what Nicole Fleetwood names carceral aesthetics, a framework for revealing the, uh, revealing the conditions of power and the materiality of prisons. So what's in the book? The book has four sections specific to prison industrial complex and its connection with racial capitalism, a section on the checks and challenges of embracing what Patrice Cullors calls non-reformist reforms, AKA how to work within harmful power structures without supporting them, a section on building community, and it ends with a section on interconnectedness and future dreaming. Contained within this book are call-ins and strategies to address the failures of the theater industry and higher education. Contributors address issues like the exploitative nature of the Broadway industrial complex, the mythic norm of whiteness, and offer some successes in the form of case studies around the ethics of storytelling for marginalized groups, harm reduction practices and ensemble, and the limits of theater for social change and theater for the oppressed. At the end of our panel and in the support materials, we'll provide a link for where and how to order the book, but we look forward to for future engagement around our work and to continue to build movement around abolitionist theater making. And written just for this panel, I offer an abolition invocation. Come May, come May, ripen buds, crack open, send winds from north, south, east and west, name, feel, make, attempt, resurrect, sit, organize, 
demand, wonder dream, reflect, write, act, emerge, write, pull, armchair analyze, dismantle, create, stay, dedicate, divest, disclose, dedicate, root, hold love, hold rest, teach, address, stay, in urgent slow space, a constellation bloomed, liberated, come May, May, come. I'll hand off now to Lynn Baker Nauman and Spoon Jackson. Great, thank you. Oh, that was that was beautiful. I was moving, and oh, thank you. So good to see all the other contributors and and be a part of this whole process. So excited to introduce to you, um, Spoon Jackson, whom I met in 2017, Solano State Prison creating Shakespeare together. And we connected through music actually because he is a flautist as well, create, made his own flout, flute. <laughs> um, and he is a internationally renowned poet and an author and uh, an actor and artist and podcaster and just has created so many things. He's just a creator in so many ways and a connector. He loves connecting people and um, has done so much work. And we need to get this man out of prison. Um, and here's a photo of him when he was working on a podcast a few years back. And um, I want to know, and I want to say also his work ethic is just amazing, was on top of it every step of the way <laughs> and was great at keeping me in line. So I, I very much appreciate him as a collaborator um, because I had not ever written a chapter before. So he was just on it. It was fantastic working with him. And so Spoon, I'm going to turn it over to you. He's here. He can't see you, but he can hear you. So Spoon, hello. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And uh, I want to introduce my friend and colleague of, uh, uh, you know, uh, theater healing or healing of theater. And I met her, like she said, at the, when I came here. And they automatically put me into Shakespeare and to write and practice and talk about history. So I looked around and I, I think my soul really looked around and found somebody that I could connect with. And then as time went on, uh, she showed me that she was being real, and that's what matters to me is being real and being on top of your your acting or acting. You're doing that acting. And so I want to introduce a great person and friend, Lynn Edgar, and I was just honored to do it. Right just that. Hey. I'm honored to be in this book. Hold up. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you. So, um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions and we're just, you know, we only have a few minutes. So just to yeah. ask you, like, what was this process like of, of all of that you've experienced in theater before I'd met you and then with Shakespeare together? 60 seconds remaining. 60 seconds. Really? Don't Confused the lady. She's on it. He'll fall back. So yeah. let's take the 60 seconds, yeah. if you will. Yeah, it was like, a, it, it was a blessing. So, uh, I like producing. I found out from uh, my publisher that I'm a producer, and I like bringing uh, to life stuff inside other people, which helps bring to life stuff inside me. And with Lynn, that was a beautiful thing that was going on during the process. You know, we uh, uh, we chat, and then we write stuff, and then we go back and forth editing over the topic, but we got topics here now. And so it came out that it was just a great honor, you know, just to work with her. Her, her work that it. It's her work ethic, and it fits perfectly with mine. Nice. Thank you. Um, and as I want to say, as a drama therapist, my background working with Spoon meant that he um, was able to uh, jump First in. Call and or telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Jump in, and he's going to call back. Um, and be able to utilize the fact that he was sometimes considered, you know, someone to want to keep to himself, but always wanted to create. And so he, when you could make that bridge, it, he just flourished. Um, and so speaking about his, uh, the work that 
he shared in the chapter was really inspiring for me to be able to 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 read it and then to pick it apart and discuss it and talk about it um and so as a deep thinker it was it was great collaborating back and forth and and picking apart what abolitionists like what does that mean what does that how does that connect to his world when he is inside and can't see it from our perspective so um we're just gonna wait for the computer lady um also want to say he has a, a brand new album he may not say this and we may not have time to share but as his spoken word um with a collaborator so it's on spotify right now you can look up spoon jackson it's called no moon and it's um i think i have my phone on do not disturb so will i actually hear the phone call we'll see um we'll hope he can call right back so um Maybe it's, maybe we're just up to you, Rivka, if you want to wait for the phone call or. That's wanna... fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, send me a message in the chat when he calls back and we'll jump back in um, yes. to your considerations. Thank you so much to both of you. I'll throw it over to Kathy Nye, Robert Villanueva and Brandon de Santiago. Hello. Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Nye. I'm the chair of the theater and dance departments at Pasadena City College. And uh, I was had the honor of submitting the chapter Impact, which included my conversation with Brandon and Robert, who had been a part of a performance we created at PCC in 2021. Um, I'm gonna minimize what I say because I wanna hand it over to these two fantastic students. Uh, when I arrived at PCC, I had pretty quickly started reaching out to our different organizations on campus to see how we could collaborate in the theater department. And the folks at CORE like got it. They were like, use theater to tell stories for our students. Yes, we wanna be a part of this. Um, it was the easiest sell I think I've ever made about using theater for social change and um, started almost a two year long process of prepping before we even talked about creating a performance. And that involved a lot of, of training for me so that I knew what I was doing before um, working with the community. And so we created a devised piece and uh, Brandon and Robert were were part of that. And then we uh, did a production of Luis Alfaro's Oedipus El Rey. And because that places the story of Oedipus within the context of the impact of the incarceration system, um, we were really excited to have students who were involved in our devised piece and who were themselves impacted by the incarceration system be in our production of Oedipus. And now that relationship has just continued to bloom and uh, we go see shows together, um, plays that both address the incarceration system, but also don't. And, and we've just developed this little group of theater makers and theater lovers. And I'm so proud to say that Brandon is now a theater major at UCLA and Robert, has expressed aspirations to go to UCLA's rival school, USC. And uh, I'm gonna hand it over to them to share their experience, both being a part of the project that we share in the chapter. Uh, oh, I did wanna outline super quickly that in the chapter, um, I talk about the inspiration for the project, the methodology of creating the piece, which uh, utilized a lot of Boal and image theater. Um, what our goals were for the piece, which was really about teaching faculty, students, and staff at PCC um, how to how to support our students impacted by the incarceration system. And we did a really cute sketch where we we shared an experience that one of our students had had, and then we sort of did a rewind and played it back with a more supportive scenario. Um, and then the chapter also includes a segment of the script, as well as my conversation with Robert and Brandon. So now I will hand it over to two of the best students I could have ever worked with. Brandon, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I do want to just uh, start off with this. 
is I woke up thinking like, oh my God, what am I going to say today? Um, but I do want to, to, to say that you do not let, you don't have to let your past define where you're going in the future. Um, as someone who has been formerly incarcerated, I really didn't have any hope when I got out of, of the system, I was broken. And uh, uh, Dr. Nye really showed me that I can get back into theater, I can express myself and actually move forward. And now I'm here at the UCLA campus protesting uh, and being heard and making theater and experience in life that I never thought I'd ever possibly have. And I just did a 10 uh, week intensive with the Actors Gang uh, with their prison project. And it was, it was very cathartic for me because I was able to identify what I was feeling, why I was feeling it, how it's affecting me and how it also affected all of those around me and to shed light on everything that the injustice of the criminal it, it, criminal system has done to the people that go through it and how we can move forward through it. It was just an amazing experience, both freedom and Oedipus. It was, it was amazing, you know, and we got to work with masks. I mean, come on. It's great. It was great. I had such a great time with both Kathy and Robert. It was amazing. Mwah. And I just have to throw in a little brag. Brandon went on to do, I think he's like tied for the record of the most productions at PCC before he graduated. And he played Puck in our production of Shakespeare in Hollywood and blew everyone out of the water. So I, if, if I played any part in you reconnecting with your theatrical self, that's the best news because you are a star, darling. Thank you. Thank you. I do that for my, my, my auditions now when they ask, oh, you got a monologue. I'm like, Puck, I got it. It's, it's go straight into it. Right. It's there. It's here. It's here. It's here. Robert, do you want to share your experiences working on the project and being a part of this book? Yes. So for me, um, whether incarcerated or, or out here in society, I've always felt like incarcerated. So the, so in theater, during the play and the rehearsing and everything, it stopped like all like all those crazy thoughts, thinking, the trauma, dwelling on the past, the for me, future tripping, you know, the anxiety, like where, where is my life going to end up at? Am I going to die in prison? Am I going to die in the streets? And um, so on stage, that's where I actually experienced freedom. And playing um King King uh, Leis, where he dies by his son, and his son, you know, that's a to me, that's when I really was able to wrap my head around reality. Like I didn't want to be that typical that typical gang member who changes and gets killed, like by somebody young, like old enough to be like their son. And surely that that happened to one of the guys that I grew up with that showed me pretty much the ropes in, in the system, like how to program. Within that within that week of that play, he got killed. And then my and then one of my closest friends, he he died in overdose. And then and unfortunately, like, like a few months after, I went back to prison. I recently paroled in September. And um uh, so right now I'm here at Impact. It's an it's a alcohol and drug treatment center and I'm an intern. So I co-facilitate groups. And like my whole life has been like a show, has been an act. But in but in this play, Oedipus Del Rey, I actually felt like authentic. I felt like liberated. I felt freedom. And it, and it allows me, so theater allows me to stay in the present. Like I don't want to dwell on the past, like what if, what if, like in the what ifs, the poor me syndrome or future trip. I'd be present and, and I just get it. I just get everything done. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm a procrastinator. So if I don't stay in the present, I'm not gonna take care of anything. So theater, so theater has been very, very like liberating for me. That's pretty. I have, that's to, I have to say that Robert, his, uh, the conversation we have in this chapter in the book, Robert, Robert, first of all, is a poet. He's a philosopher. That is his nature, and um, the way that he articulates how theater teaches him how to move through the world is some of the best articulation of that that I've ever 
encountered. And, and I really um, am so grateful, Robert, for your words, because, you know, if I ever have to justify at PCC or anywhere else, the impact that theater can have, I'm just going to hand over your, your words. Um, and, and Robert is just absolutely going to go out there and make waves. So everyone, <laughs> everyone memorize this precious, precious face. And I, and I want to share super quickly that when we were doing rehearsals for our devised piece, um, I had the students walk across the stage, holding on to something that they considered like weighing them down or something that they were holding on to. And then I had them walk back across the stage, imagining that they had let that thing go. And I was kind of making the exercise up. <laughs> And Robert came over to me afterwards and he said, I think I just let go of 30 years of anger and resentment. And I think we both burst into tears. And it just was such a moment that that sometimes the most simple exercise and movement and storytelling can really change someone's life. And um, it was profound. It was profound for me and, and profound for Robert and um, just man, if anything has made me believe in the power of theater, it's been working with these two and the others who were involved in the project. Thank you so much, Brandon and Robert and Kathy. I'm gonna throw things over now to Aubrey Helene Newman. Hello, and, and thank you um, both groups for getting started. I am looking forward to reading your chapters. Um, so I uh, work at Davis and Elkins College and my specialty lies in community engaged theater with young people. And so uh, I've always admired the work that Rivka does and liked hearing about it and, and what was being accomplished, but I never necessarily saw my work in line with abolitionism uh, until uh, Rivka propo pro proposed this book. And I started thinking about the uh, power structures. Well, I continued thinking about the power structures that are present in the school system uh, and the ways that uh, it uh, aligns and perpetuates the, the same uh, inequities that we see within the prison system. And so my Chapter is called Disrupting Hierarchies, Theater for Social Change as a Rehearsal for Liberation and Secondary Education. Uh, and it speaks to uh, three little experiments. So following Miriam Cabo's call for a million little experiments that will help us uh, move farther away from this white supremacist status quo that we find ourselves living in, um, uh, exploring the different ways of uh, upsetting existing power inequities in school systems. So the first case study I talk about, uh, I speak to a situation in which the um, teach, I was a teaching artist assistant and the teaching artist in question was clearly looking for a narrowly defined um, theater for social justice, uh, which meant that we had students who were like, I wanna talk about bad school lunches, which there are so many inequities that we could talk about with bad school lunches, uh, but that didn't fit with this preconceived notion of uh, theater for social change. And consequently, we when the students' thoughts were not heard, we did not adapt to them. And so it was just a program that said, we are going to empower you, but only if you do it our way, which is not the lesson that I think any of us in this room want to be perpetuating when we work with participants. And so uh that early experience stuck with me it is actually what led me to choose working with youth as kind of my dissertation focus uh and um moving forward working to upset those power structures is really challenging i find myself perpetuating them sometimes myself i'm like okay we're just going to finish this one exercise it's not really a big deal if we finish that one exercise we could let that exercise go and in that moment a participant gets to be the one who uh, controls the fate and the process. Um, so I, I am by no means the one who has this figured out, but I do call for uh, disrupting the hierarchies of the classroom. So how do we disrupt the space? How do we encourage 
um, students to be able to voice their thoughts regardless of what they are uh, and whether or not we agree with them. Uh, and going along with that, disrupting the hierarchies of theater practice. Um, so instead of calling for short skits that students might recognize as theater, but doesn't allow them to truly explore their uh, artistic abilities, how do we introduce theatrical possibilities that they can then pull from? And so I'll wrap it up last but not least, my, my little offering in terms of the guidebook is an exercise called World's Smallest Stage, which allows one person to tell one of their stories. Uh, one person provides the, um, the physical gestures that represent the story. You can do it on Zoom, right? The little person comes across the stage uh, and one person provides sound effects. And what I found was this disrupted the traditional like skit structure of theater practice uh, and made it a lot easier for my students or the students I was working with to start telling their own stories. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Thanks so much, Aubrey. Um, we're gonna go next to Elisa Vera Ramos. Hello. I'm going to set myself a little timer because I notoriously talk a lot. Um, my name is Elisa Vera Ramos. Uh, she, her pronouns, and I am one of the authors of the chapter, uh, The Taker's Tower Will Fall, Epic Lessons in Co-Creation. Um, my co-author's name is Mariana M.G. Green, um, and just want to shout them out today. Um, so the, that chapter is really about- The call has been forwarded to voicemail. The person uh, you're trying to reach is not a um, it, the chapter is about interpersonal and uh, like relationships and playmaking as abolitionist practice. Um, and it really centers on this play that we began to write in 2015 slash 2016 with a group of quote unquote femmes of color, which is the concept we unpack, um, uh, which is called Femelanin. Um, and the play was called Epic Tales from the Land of Melanin. And it's a theater for young audiences play. I mean, originally we wrote it, we were saying it's decolonial, it's liberatory, you know, it centers on these um, three young people who um, are femmes, who are incredible, who are, you know, really doing things um, in a way that is uh, towards justice to really take down their colonizers, um, which are called the takers in the play. Um, and uh, we didn't call it abolitionist at the time, but now in our lives um, and after like lots of learning and uprisings and relationships, right? Um, we call ourselves abolitionists now. So we said under Ruth Wilson Gilmore's concept of abolition is presence, um, this play really needs to be in this book um, because we see these young people, these three main characters, um, really seeing each other, um, navigating conflict, um, mindfulness in the face of danger, busting a comrade out of jail through dance. Um, and that it also is a play that is participatory, right? So that the young people in the audience and any age of audience can actually practice these behaviors during the play itself. Um, we sing to our ancestors. You know, there's so much beautiful stuff in there that we would call abolitionists at the time or now. Um, I want to walk you through the other parts of the chapter because it's not just the play and that's something that's really important to us, right? Um, so the second section is about how we made it, how we devised it, um, a lot of good in the collaboration and a little bit more about how we came to call ourselves abolitionists. Um, and our characters are really our role models. Um, but, and we didn't always in the making of the play, um, live up to their example. So that was something that MG and I really wanted to write about. Um, and it's very vulnerable to us and we've been nervous to put this out into the world, but we also think it's really important, um, for practitioners. Um, and so, uh, number three is called through poisonous terrain, right? Um, so we talk about the characteristics of white supremacy culture, Tamo Kuhn's work. Um, and we say, I want to read from the book. Um, white supremacy culture and all of the ways in which humans uphold its inherent perversions by participating in that culture is incompatible with abolition. So that's really coming from our learning and our collaborations with Black feminists. Um, so number four is called the part about our fuck ups. <laughs> so we literally write things that we did that we would not do again. Um, that caused a lot of harm and rupture in our communities and our and in our um, 
and our playmaking uh, and our relationships. Um, there's a lot of grief. Um, and uh, we want to also take this opportunity to be accountable, right? Um, and so we're we're identifying those things that we um, call our fuck ups and and linking them with white supremacy culture um, frameworks. So urgency, paternalism, uh, fear of open conflict, um, quantity over quality, and over the humans, right? Um, and the truth is that um, you know we do all these things in theater. <laughs> Those are things that are inherent a lot of times to theater practices. And so MG and I, as authors of this book and also two of the leaders of the process, you know, we wanna say when we were leading this process, we upheld a lot of these things that of course were learned, but that doesn't mean that they're okay, right? Um, and so number five, the section is meant to be, um, you know, lessons in co-creation. Creation. So really direct ways to say, you know, we should do these things like um, uphold and set boundaries, um, self-reflection, like a lot of self-awareness, um, structures of accountability before conflict happens, um, rest, <laughs> processing grief, you know, as opposed to being like, I'm always fine, um, and having more money. Uh, those are some of them. And then um, our last section is called um, The Tower Will Fall. So, you know, in the play, the takers who are the colonizers live in the tower and we're going to take down the takers tower. Um, but in this chapter, we are also using all of our um, tools um, as queer abolitionists, you know, humans, artists. Um, and so we also were taking on the idea of tarot um, in that last section. So thinking about the the card, the, the tower, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I want to say that a couple of our other tools were um, humor. We put a lot of jokes in the uh, footnotes. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we rested and we cried a lot while we wrote this. So thanks to Rivka for allowing us that spaciousness. That was really rad. And of course, we're swearing. Um, in an academic text. So um, the last thing that I want to say um, about that last section is, um, again, from the book. So thinking about the tower as the tarot card, um, the tower card signifies a time of destruction and collapse, like the one we're in. It's a painful and sudden dismantling of those things we thought would keep us safe. Beliefs, ways of moving through the world, relationships, systems. A common expression of the tower card in tarot is the tower will fall. It means that irreversible change is in this moment already happening. Um, so our call at the very end is to get in the right relationship with that fall. And that's all. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Elisa. Um, we're going to throw it over to Dr. Rachel Rhodes and Lori Pitt next. Hello all, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Rachel Rhodes, I use she, her pronouns. I'm so excited, Lori's here too. Um, <laughs> I'll start us off. Uh, so our chapter was entitled um, Abolition in Prisons and Teacher Education Through Theater of the Oppressed. Um, so I'll chat a little bit about one of the projects that I write about in this. Um, it took place in Toronto. Uh, it's called a program Youth Artists for Justice. And so we created an ethnodrama, a research-based piece. Um, it was with 12 racialized uh, high school students um, in Toronto. And uh, we used theater of the oppressed techniques in combination with them doing research, all based on the question, uh, what do you wish you had more influence over in society? And that became a, a lot about um, abolition within the schooling context. So the um, the students involved having interactions with school resource officers um, and seeing carcerality both in their schooling spaces and um, being humiliated and hyper surveilled within their neighborhoods as well. Um, so we did uh, exercises such as three images. So you start off with what's the real in your community, what's the ideal, um, and then what is the transition, which is the hardest part to get from the real to the ideal. Um, and I just wanna bring in one of the youth voices here. Um, MJ uh, wrote our final spoken word piece as an amalgamation of all of the um, identities and issues that everybody out of the 12 people had brought to the table um, and ended the piece with all of us or none of us. So that was the end of the entire thing. Um, and one of his reflections is uh, stories can be vehicles for change. 
theater is a space for imagination because I feel like in the play we wrote, it wasn't like a utopia, but it was like, what would reparations look like? It's a space where you can suspend your disbelief, but it's also a place to get you to think differently. Um, So I was so overjoyed that they uh, got really pumped about the idea of solidarity and intersectionality is the root of what they were doing as opposed to just choosing one topic. They're thinking, you know, okay, what's within and beyond my experience and how can we come together to support each other um, in all um, our, our diversity of concerns and aspirations. Um, so that was really rad. And then Lori, pass it over to you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Pitts and I use she, her pronouns. Um, yeah, I'll just add that what really interested me about our chapter was that intersection intersectionality piece um, and how Rachel, you know, was talking a lot about the school system and then we were talking about the prison system and how actually there's so much similarity um, in these like systems of oppression. And so I really loved that we were able to kind of focus on that conversation and look at both of those systemic issues. And in our work, we do a lot of legislative theater and working with people impacted by incarceration um, through these events to co-create new policy ideas alongside legislators, alongside um, activists, advocates, community organizers, and people who are just interested in the topic. So um, I really found it very cool to kind of work alongside um, Rachel's students and our community advocates in kind of exploring um, the overlap there. Um, and yeah, it was just very cool to be a part of writing a chapter because as a practitioner, I've mostly <laughs> just been practicing. So it was very cool to be able to have the experience of like writing it down and really fleshing out why does this work and what we all like know kind of like we've seen it but writing it down so I'm excited to read everyone else's chapter and then happily um uh Lori was able to come to James Madison University where I work for a guest artist residency to bring um form theater into our space to help make um, our school of theater and dance a more libertarian space for increasing communication across students and faculty and those false divides that we put up. While there's real power dynamics, there's also um, a lot of opportunity for coming together um, and creating positive change. So that was also an honor to have you join us. <laughs> it was an honor to be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we had what was really fun about the chapter was that we had um, a couple of focus groups with the actual participants that we worked with. So um, we had a number of Lori's um, participants in Voices Unbarred um, and then students from across six years of me working with them in different um, in different classes. Um, and another one of the uh, theater of the oppressed techniques that I used um, with my class is um using collective form theater. So um, I coin it that way because as opposed to just having one protagonist, it's exciting to have um, as many protagonists as possible coming from different positionalities um, and coming from different sort of expert backgrounds through their own lived experiences. Um, so I find, again, it's like, I'm very interested in combining research and theater of the oppressed um, to be bringing in as much uh, wisdom as possible um, to creating change because we know it takes a village. So um, let's have as many protagonists in the fight together as possible. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for the chapter and your words. Um, I'm going to take it to Sarah Chalmers. You are next. Hey, everybody. I'm Sarah. She, her pronouns. So great to be here. I'm hearing so many threads of, through the work um, that I recognize or that I'm excited to learn more about. Um, I'm primarily a practitioner as well. Uh, I identify as a community engaged theater artist. I was part of the founding of a community engaged theater company here in Ithaca, New York called Civic Ensemble. And part of Civic Ensemble is a program called the Reentry Theater Program. And my chapter, um, which is called The Power of Difference, Solidarity on the Path, explores a production of the reentry theater program. The reentry theater program is for people who are coming out of incarceration. So they experience jail, prison, even being institutionalized in a hospital, um, you welcome at the reentry theater program. 
Um, we had a lot of uh, addiction issues and transition issues. Um, we started making the play Streets Like This, which is what the chapter is about, in early 2017 with a small group who wanted to explore family. And what the play ended up being about was the different ways these characters that are all kind of composites for the most part, there's one specific character that I talk about that wasn't a composite um, uh, on this one street in our town and the things that they struggle with and how we kind of unearth the different challenges of coming back from incarceration in the context of this community specifically with some universal themes. So I look at the process of creating the play and I surface kind of three elements required for a liberatory theater practice, which are dialogue, interdependency, and solidarity. I've always been really um, focused on a liberatory practice where we find solidarity and it's already come up in this conversation, the challenges to that, you know, my positionality as a white woman, um, bisexual, highly educated, um, and coming into working with participants who have lived experience that I know not of, and how we meet there to work towards a collective liberation, a mutual liberation, so that the facilitator, while not the person whose story is being um, privileged, uh, is an important uh, part of the process and can get in the way or support that journey. And so I do explore ways that I might have gotten in the way, gotten in my own way, gotten in the way of the process. I'm really unpacking my own process and the process of telling people's true stories in a collective way. So I tell three stories within that, the story of a conversation about a specific uh, character in the play, a woman who is a mother and a sex worker, and an early treatment of her character is uh, was misogynistic and kind of two-dimensional. And I called it out in a reflection process, and that conversation was very challenging uh, for me and for the group. We had a good outcome, um, but I kind of unpack um, that intersectionality and also just the male dominated group that I had, that we had at that time. Um, the second story is about a participant who had mental health challenges that kind of emerged uh, during the rehearsal process, but really during production week. And uh, they were hidden from us and we had to scramble and it was, uh, it taught us a lot about interdependence and how do we make space for slowing down in those really fast moments where white supremacist urgency is taking over and we've got this deadline. Um, what does it mean, like Aubrey was saying, if we stop the game, you know, if, well, maybe it is delayed or maybe this won't work and we listen to what's happening right now. Um, the last story is about the character of Narcan Man, who was a naloxone administering superhero based on a real person in our community who absolutely went around before um, Narcan was readily available and was in this kind of gray area between legal and illegal. And uh, his story, the fullness of his story didn't really become apparent to me until I interviewed him for this chapter. And it really kind of exploded uh, my ideas about what we had done, what we could have done. And so I really explore that, that real story and the way that story was used in service of the group's goals, which were to um, really mainly, they wanted our community to see them as fully hum human which they weren't, and in the context of a supremacist system that we were all a part of and had an, a responsibility to dismantle. And the play did do that at the same time that this participant felt there was something missing, and I unpack that. In the end, the chapter asks, what would it take for us to come into solidarity across difference and dismantle our habitual ways of being and seeing each other as we journey on the path toward mutual liberation. And one conclusion I draw is that the way to leave this path that's so well lit by supremacist practices for one that's life affirming, but sometimes dark and murky is to know each other and to be known, to be vulnerable, it's already been mentioned. 
And it's in the specificity of those differences and that vulnerability that we can find the strength to do this work and keep doing it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, all right, Nick Fissett, you are our last speaker today. Thank you, Rivka. Many thanks to you, Rivka, for um, editing the volume and gathering us all here today. And I also want to uh, express my gratitude for uh, my fellow contributors um, for, for putting in such fabulous work to a really important volume. My name is Nick. I teach and direct theater at Emory University's Oxford College um, down in Atlanta. And uh, my chapter uh, is an interview uh, with uh, an award-winning playwright named Erica Dickerson Dispenza, uh, who is also a militant abolitionist. Um, if you don't know her work, you should, I, I highly recommend it. Um, the the chapter's titled, A Play is a Vehicle to Incite. And um, today I want to offer six things I learned from speaking with her, and I hope you learn them too. So the first is Erica begins... Um, our interview by outlining her biography and discussing her experience as a black feminist organizer in Chicago, and then um, during her time studying in seminary in Dallas. Um, and this taught me that um, we live our politic and the way we live and love and work and exist in the world must be in alignment with our politic. Um, one example of this right now is the protests currently going on around the country um, and supporting these protests, student protests, I mean, and elsewhere, uh, supporting the protests, however you can, is abolitionist. These protests call for divestment from um, the U.S. policing machine, which is directly and intimately connected with Israel. Cop City, um, if you haven't heard of it here in Atlanta, is, is directly based on Little Gaza, where IDF soldiers train. And uh, through the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, or GILI, uh, Georgia cops train directly with the IDF. It's like an international law enforcement exchange of resources. Uh, so living in abolitionist politic means supporting uh, these students who are agitating against genocide uh, that is funded and supported directly by the United States, especially by the cops. The second thing I learned is that abolition is love, but it's a militant kind of love. In the interview, Erica says that, quote, care is the tender acknowledgement and praxis of how you move moves me. It's very it's being invested in learning how to be symbiotic and flow with others, being tender and available enough to try that, fail, try again and keep trying, end quote. So love is a, a is a militant understanding and practice of interdependence, which has come up, which others have said, interconnectedness, that with every breath, we work toward freeing ourselves and one another. And today, actually, Erica Dickerson Dispenza has a very active social media uh, presence, especially on Twitter. And it's not a private account, so I don't think it's out of bounds for me to, to mention one thing she tweeted today. She said, quote, I don't believe in peaceful nonviolence in the face of and in response to violence. In my love and light praxis, the light is a lit match, and the love is my ancestor's breath helping to burn all this shit down, end quote. Third thing I learned is when starting a project, a theater project especially, ask yourself, uh, quote, how does this free us? How does this project potentially move the needle in revolutionary action in my local, national, and or global communities, end quote? Uh, uh, by the way, and Sarah I was sort of talking about this, others have talked about this a little bit, this us that, that Erica is mentioning, it needs to be sort of carefully defined, I think, especially if, like me, you're, you're a, a white cis theater artist, right? The us, the us that Erica's, uh, I think, referencing arises from a radical Black feminist understanding of collective, queer feminist understanding of collectives that I, I think uh, white people and others must collaborate with and conspire with and serve as accomplices, not allies, but accomplices with in struggle. The fourth thing I learned is how you do a theater project, the practices undertaken at each stage of the process, from dreaming up the project to assembling an ensemble to rehearsal to the performance is important in creating an abolitionist space to radicalize all involved. In rehearsals, Erica shifts power dynamics. She builds altars that the cast and crew can contribute to. 
She uses black indigenous practices to, to decolonize the process. She makes tea. They play double Dutch. They do the electric slide. They do shoulder massages and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually think that theater makers sort of already understand this and do this um, and often use theater space, rehearsal spaces to advance their politic. But Erica's sort of calling it out uh, explicitly and saying, well, if you have a radical politic, then your theater practices should be in alignment with that. Um, and she, she, another example is she includes a playwright's note with her playbills at all her plays that radically reorients how audiences receive plays to change theater etiquette. Um, one of the, she says like this here is a free black space, a juke joint, a Baptist church. She invites the audience to uh, respond vocally or however they want. Um, and in, a, in an effort to de-police the viewing process of the play and the listening process of the play. Two final things. The fifth thing I learned is a sort of reading list and Rivka put up a reading list, but I'll shout more things that we can read. So in terms of theater makers, playwrights, uh, Erica shouts out Entezake Shange, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, Alice Childress, Nisi Aya, Alicia Harris, Lady uh, Dane Figuera Didi, Christiana Colon, and uh, when she re when she recommended this, I sort of, uh, it's a pretty crusty recommendation, but I think it's good. Clifford Odets. She shouts out Clif Clifford Odets and I was like, whoa, okay. Um, but it's uh, it's interesting in the inter interview how she connects that to abolition. Um, but she also shouts out non-theater works, Mariam Kaba, Charlie uh, uh, Carruthers, Angela Davis, um, Kianga Yamada-Taylor, Adrian Marie Brown, Alexis Pauline Gums, the Kambahi um, River Collective and others as well. The final thing I'll share, the sixth thing I learned from my interview with Erica Dickerson Dispenza is um, abolish Broadway, stop Cop City, divest from Israel, free Palestine. Thanks so much, Nick. And thank you all contributors. Um, just some uh, closing notes and then I'll open it for some final thoughts from folks because we have time. What a blessing time is. Um, one, these are not all of our contributors. So there are more facets and bits of wisdom and perspectives and experiences that are in the book. So to channel my own reading rainbow, like if you want to know more, read the book. Um, and it is available on Rutledge's website. Uh, and I know we all are charged and energized to keep this movement going um, and to put our practice in relationship to other people's practices. Um, I quote Loretta Ross, who's a reproductive justice scholar in the introduction, who says that uh, if we move together and all think and say and do the same thing, it is a cult, <laughs> but only if we find a way to move together in our differences is it a movement. And I think that um, the book really embodies that practice. So I'm gonna throw it up to y'all. Uh, final thoughts as we're wrapping up. I suppose I can just speak quickly that Spoon really wanted to come back. He was having issues with the computer people, computer later, lady, he calls her. And um, so he wasn't able to come back. But thank you all for, you know, dealing with the process of trying to speak to people inside. And that's what, what we dealt with throughout our collaboration as well. So that was a good, actually a good representation of that. That's right. The state will intervene and interrupt your call at the least opportune moment. So uh, I think it's appropriate that we had that demonstrated so clearly and loved having Spoon's voices at the top. So please uh, convey that love to him. Other final thoughts, things you didn't get to? I just want to express appreciation, which I didn't get a chance to do for you, Rivka, and for everyone who contributed and being a part of something like this is very new for me, even just writing and being published in a chapter. But, you know, this burgeoning reframe of my own work, and it sounds like for other people, too, about thinking about it in terms of abolitionist theater um, and the 
the solidarity I feel just being in this Zoom right now and the hope that we'll have more conversations together um, and connect across space and time more often to, it, it, we need each other to do this work. So um, I welcome that. Um, I just want to say that I think it's really exciting um, to um, have our practices documented, you know, writing ourselves into existence, whether that's, I heard a lot of people say, I'm a practitioner. I don't always have time <laughs> to do our resources to do this. Right. And I definitely feel that. And I also think any way that we can continue to spotlight really good work that's happening. If someone has, you know, institutional, um, resources, time, if your job is a, a, you know, academic or writer, you know, how can we make sure that we're uplifting and putting concrete and into print um, really important work that's happening so that all of it can come together, um, you know, in a way that is, is that movement. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah, I think one of the unique things about the timeline of this book is that um, y'all submitted your first draft full proposals April 15th, 2022. So like two years ago, and it was, we were not fully back on stages. We were still in that um, in-between space coming out of the pandemic. And for so many practitioners, COVID allowed for forced a pause and gave an ability to reflect, write, um, and then connect with each other because we weren't like in facilities in, you know, like in places that we're normally just giving, giving time and self to. And I think that, um, that meant that we, a lot of practitioner voices could be inside of this collection, which is so exciting. And the format of interviews too, to take some of the pressure off of, like you have to write a whole thing, like just let the interview stand for the experience, which is a, I think a nice blend and form too. Hey, that was my my latency, my teacher wait time. Um, but I I feel like we have offered so much, and I look forward to continued conversations with y'all. Want to thank HowlRound for uh, hosting this live streaming, um, and giving support. Um, and I look forward to continuing in solidarity and struggle in liberation and enjoy with all of y'all. Um, be well, take care.